friends, John Vukic. John, I swear I did everything right. I, 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 I did the biometry. I did it personally, okay? I, I marked the, 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 the patient while she was sitting up. I, you know, there was a little cyclotorsion. I identified it. I corrected for it. I did abrometry. I did everything. And I, I swear the lens was, the torque lens was in the right position within a, a fraction of a degree. And postoperatively, it's just, it's, it's not in the same place where I put it. The, the, the torque lens has, has rotated, and I mean, I imagine in life there are things that are more frustrating, but I can't think of them. <laughs> this is, I mean, it, it, you're right, absolutely right. All of the energy that we put into determining how much astigmatism there is, where it's located, making sure the axis is correct, and then placing the lens exactly at that axis, it really doesn't matter if the lens moves after we put it there. So it really is important to, there's some things we can do to mitigate that risk. Uh, there's also some things we can do that maybe the companies can do to make a better lens. Now, you, you've, you've studied this. I mean, you've, you, you've an actual study on rotational stability of, of torque lenses, right? Yes, and to address that very issue, uh, there have been, and in fact, I was part of uh, what I believe is the most carefully conducted study of post-operative rotation of a torque lens ever conducted. Uh, the methodology was uh, very impressive, uh, looking at digitalized images, uh, looking at iris landmarks as well as limbal landmarks to get registration. A minimum of 10 different landmarks were identified at the immediate post-operative uh, um, time frame and then at one day, one month, three months, and six months, and to align those, and we could detect rotational stability to one half of one degree. We could detect that amount of change uh, from visit to visit. And so looking at that then gave us the ability to say, all right, now what features of the lens could be changed that would allow that stability to be improved upon? And that's exactly what we looked at. So I, I, I have... I have three questions, uh, and the only answer that I care about is, is the third one. So you, you can fluff your way through the first two. The question one is, why do the lenses rotate? Uh, question two is, is, when in the postoperative course do they rotate? Is it you know, when I take the lid speculum out, or is it one week later? Or, well, it's not one week later. But uh, And the third thing is, are there any variables that I can control to minimize rotation? Well. Yes to all of those. However, um, the majority of rotations occur within the first day, and almost all occur within the first week. So before the lens has seated, before there has been any sort of contraction of the capsule, before there's been what we consider you know, uh, significant healing has occurred, that's when this uh, is, is most likely. Uh, as far as what can we do to minimize the chance that that will occur, well, we know that there are some things that are, are likely components to, uh, to make the rotation more likely. Um, one is retained viscoelastic beneath the lens. Uh, so in the vac capsular bag, removing that and doing that carefully. Posterior to the lens. Posterior saying. to the lens, yes, beneath, be yeah. uh, on the z-axis behind. Um, tapping the lens down so that it is in contact with the posterior capsule to seat the lens just a little bit. Um, waiting for the lens to have fully unfolded and the haptics to reach their full extent before you decide that you're happy with where it is. You know, sometimes you get kind of lucky and the lens just unfolds and it's exactly where you want it. You just go, oh, oh, we're done. A and you don't take those additional steps or moments to say, all right, is the lens completely seated? Have I removed this glass? Have I tapped it down? But even beyond those things, there are some things that are beyond our control, and that is, what is the design of the lens? Are there features about the lens that could make this a better uh, uh, solution? Are there? Well, that's exactly what we looked at. And so uh, the question is, can we take what is not a common uh, problem, but a problem when it occurs that has to be dealt with surgically? You have to go back in the eye to rotate it. So I was part of a study that looked at different configurations. And so what are the things that would change the stability within the lens? Well, there could be the length of the lens overall. There could be the design of the haptics. Could there be less or more compliance? Could there be maybe frosting on the haptics that would create an additional amount of friction? Uh, and we looked at four different iterations of this, uh, saying, all right, which of those would make the difference that would eliminate, or to the extent we can, minimize rotation? 
and and we found a clear winner. Uh, and uh, quite frankly, oh, it was, uh, don't leave me hanging. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I'll start by saying it, it was the one design that I thought eh, I'll never work. Uh, it was the one I thought, all right, this is kind of a blow away. It's almost a control. It's not going to happen. Um, by simply not polishing, by frosting the edge of the haptics, it created an additional frictional component that essentially, I don't want to say eliminate, but the data showed that at three months, it was accurate to within 0.71 degrees of attempted versus achieved with a standard deviation of less than one degree. But that's really, really interesting. I mean, I, I would have thought that it, it would have dealt with, with haptic length. Well, that's exactly what we thought as well. I, I would have thought haptic length would have been it, so it's going to somehow seat better. But in fact, haptic length didn't make a difference. Uh, it was, is the lens, does the haptic configuration, and it has a, the, uh, there was a bit of a square edge because it wasn't polished the same. So there was a bit of a square edge, and then there was this frosting. A and you could actually feel it when you put these lenses in the eye. So the analogy that I'll make is, you know, if, if we're used to a very high quality audio component, maybe that has a dial that would tune with the radio or maybe the volume up or down, you know, there's, there's a friction plate in that. It's not like you couldn't just give it a little spin and just keep spinning. It, there's an amount of friction that is, it gives you the accuracy of saying, I'm going to turn it, and then when I take my hands off, uh, it stays exactly where I left it. And it was the same feeling with the frosted haptics, is that you would adjust the lens to where you wanted it, stop with any sort of just micro-torsional force that you're using to adjust the lens, and it just stays there. Uh, just like you would with a friction plate uh, for a device that you're controlling. A and it was the same whether you were going clockwise or counterclockwise. And so that added component of friction uh, that was appositional friction of the haptics to the capsule bag made all the difference. So uh, I'm, I'm going to hold your feet to the fire with, 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 with one thing. In, in my practice, and I suspect that I'm, I'm representative with this, the, the, the cases of uh, clinically significant post-operative rotation are really pretty rare. Mm -hmm. Was the study large enough that you found enough magnitude in rotation with the other groups that you could say that this group was significantly different? Uh, yes, there were significant differences between the groups, uh, and we looked at that very carefully. So, and, and this was a, 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 a well, first of all, it was a multi-center study. It wasn't a study done at one place. It was done with multiple surgeons, and there were hundreds of eyes that were done. Uh, and so this was not a small or trivial study. Uh, the uh, data, I think, is it was significant uh, for all of the statistical analysis. Now, th this, is, this is fascinating. It's clinically useless if I can't get my hands on this lens. So, I mean, will it, and maybe this is something you can talk about, uh, Something you can talk about, I want to hear. A am I going to have access to a lens with uh, this enhancement that will increase the lens stability? Well, I mean, as we all know, there's a regulatory process, so that changes that are made in the design of a lens have to be thoroughly uh, looked at and carefully vetted, and then there has to be uh, both a labeled indication as well as a change for an approval by uh, our regulatory body, the FDA. And so to the extent that that is in process is absolutely the case. Um, I, I, you will have access to this lens. Uh, at what point that occurs, uh, I would predict the near future, um, simply because it is, is in my opinion, such a clear improvement. But again, uh, there's other steps that need to be taken in terms of the uh, final approval. But I would say, yes, you will have this lens, uh, and it is uh, something that uh, I am anxious to get my hands on on a routine basis. Uh, this sounds great. This sounds great. It, it, you know, it's one thing to, to identify a, a problem. Uh, it's another thing to fix it. Uh, John, I want to th thank you for, for, for bringing this good news. Uh, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, trying this out. And um, as always, I want to thank you for being so very generous with your time with us today. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.